Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to see that so many of you made it all the way here. Did you swim across from the uh, hotels? Yeah. I think we should start off by giving ourselves a round of applause for being so good swimming over here. Whoa! <laughs> right, that's going to make everyone wake up and also confuse everyone else that just started their sessions. So we're going to be talking about what's coming in .NET 8 and C Sharp 12. It can be a little bit difficult to keep up with what's happening with .NET and, and C Sharp. And it's interesting because up until now, most of what I've talked about at conferences is what's been happening with C Sharp over the past few years. But since the new versions of .NET and C Sharp are just around the corner, it's going to be released in a couple of weeks after this conference in November. I think it's safe to talk about some of the things that are coming in the new versions. Before we get into that, my name is Philip Ekberg. It's my third time coming to Porto. I always love coming here and having good conversations in the hallways. And I always say, send me an email if you have any questions after the talk. You can send me an email during the talk as well if you would like to. It's funny because I never receive any emails. And I realized a few months ago that I forgot to put my email on the slide which is why people never contacted me. And when I did add it, people do send me emails, so I love that. I love having conversations about what's happening in C-sharp and .NET and, and everything around programming in, in .NET and C-sharp. All right, so we're going to be discussing quite a lot of the language features of C-sharp and what's coming in .NET, while this here shows a tag cloud of what's happened to C-sharp the past decade. We're not going to spend much time going into each of these different features, but it illustrates that the language keeps evolving which also means that the framework or .NET as a, as, a, as a tool also has to evolve. The runtime keeps evolving to adapt to these new features. And also, we get things that are more in line with what we expect, such as support for mobile development, better applications for the web with Blazor and everything that's new in ASP.NET Core. And that's some of the things that we're going to be covering here today. So we'll start off by talking a little bit about what's new in .NET and looking at the features that have been added and what's coming and, and what you can expect out of that. I'll also talk a little bit about what's happened in .NET 7 when we come to those interesting features. It's interesting because there's a massive amount of information online. If you search for what's new in .NET 8 or what's new in ASP.NET Core 8, there's going to be like 14 different blog posts. Each of them are 5,000 uh, words plus. So it takes like a week to read through them all. So it can be a little bit of a, a work to get all of this uh, knowledge into your head. So I've picked out some of the best things that I think are coming in .NET 8. We're going to be talking about time providers and system.txt.json and, and so forth. Before we get into this, how many of you are using the new thing called .NET from .NET 5 and onwards? All of you. .NET 6 and onwards. 7 and onwards. Oh, I see some hands going down. Eight. Nine? <laughs> and, oops, no one. They've actually started the work on .NET 9 as well and C Sharp 13. So we'll, we'll discuss that as well and what you could expect out of that. So it's interesting to see that so many of you are already on the newer versions of .NET. Mo most of the people I, I tend to visit at, at bigger corporations, they are still stuck on .NET framework. They have to find ways to get onto .NET. And maybe they've been investing in .NET Core and want to now upgrade to .NET 6, 7, and 8 and onwards. And .NET 8 is the latest iteration or the new version that uh, has an LTS support. Their support for the different versions is a little bit different than what you might have seen in other things like Java and so forth. With .NET, every second year they release an, an LTS version. It means that it's going to be supported for a very long time. Long time support is a really important thing for really big companies. So that's why if you didn't jump on .NET 6, maybe .NET 8 is going to be the next really big release. So for Microsoft, I imagine this release being quite important. Every second release of .NET, for example, .NET, .NET 5 and .NET 7 and .NET 9, that's where they in, introduce new and kind of experimental features. I don't want to say experimental because it's still a thing that they support and will let you use in production or, or suggest that you use in production. So we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the things that they've also improved upon across all of these different releases. But one thing that all of these have in common 
everything from .NET 5 and onwards. So what happened with .NET Framework and .NET Core was that it was all just incorporated into this, this one thing now called .NET. And I still want to call it a framework, but that makes it so confusing. So I'm not going to refer to it as a framework. We'll just call it the thing going onwards. With that being said, they have one thing in common, and it's build for anything or build anything that you'd like to. So be it a web application, be it mobile, be it an IoT device, Azure, whatever. Whatever you want to build. Has anyone heard this before? <laughs> yes, everyone has heard this before. This has been the, the idea of, of .NET ever since the first iteration of .NET Framework. They've always wanted you to be able to build anything with .NET. And I would say that up until recently, that wasn't necessarily possible. But now with .NET and .NET Core being incorporated into this, making it truly cross-platform, we are very close to, to building anything. So we'll get back to mobility in a little bit, but that's one of the, the final pillars of .NET for build anything that was missing in the latest LTS version of .NET. So we'll be covering quite a few things when it comes to .NET. Before we get into that, I've, I'm very happy that I found a .NET bot. There's a .NET bot generator that I could tweak myself. I made one in scuba gear. And the reason I did that is because at one conference, I had myself in scuba gear, like full tech scuba, and someone gave me negative feedback because they didn't want to see me in scuba gear. So now I have the .NET bot in scuba gear. Anyways, we're here to talk about .NET. It's all about performance. And I'm not going to jump around like Steve Ballmer screaming, performance, performance, performance. You could imagine that yourself. So since .NET 6, they've made a huge investment into making performance one of the main goals of going forward. It's supposed to be the fastest thing around. You can compare it to C++ because that's a totally different thing. But it's still going to be the most performant thing on the market for what it can support you to do like web development, startup times, mobile applications that should be running natively and feeling like a native application, anything like that. It should be highly efficient. And what's interesting, when they've done these work for performance in the core APIs, which is the core part of .NET, they all are shared across Blazor, ASP.NET Core, Blazor, .NET MAUI, console applications, if you so like to. We'll also be going to talk about time abstractions. If you write tests, how many of you are writing tests? <laughs> all of you? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I also write tests all the time. I'm just kidding. So we're going to be talking about time abstractions, which is a way for us to improve testability of our code, which is highly important. And since most of you write tests, I think this is going to be a nice addition to, to .NET. We're going to be talking about some changes in system.txt.json. We're going to be talking about ASP.NET Core, .NET MAUI, and a few more things. And I'll mention a couple of things in terms of Blazor as well, but that's a whole topic on its own. So we'll focus on, on these things when it comes to .NET. Now, it can be a little bit confusing. Like, we, we're going to be talking about .NET 8, which is coming in, in mid-November. And if you want to use one of these versions, it can be a little bit tricky especially when we talk about the language features and how that's supported by the framework or the runtime. Over the years, C Sharp has, in the beginning of .NET, with .NET Framework, C Sharp was coupled with the release of .NET Framework. Then they decoupled that, so you could, for example, they released a C Sharp version that wasn't coupled to .NET Core 3.0, point, .NET Core 3.0, 0, 2.0, sorry. Um, but now we're back to being coupled with the runtime releases and the releases of Visual Studio and so forth. What that means is that we can expect that when the language gets an update, for example, there is a target type new expression in, in C Sharp 9, that had to have an update in the runtime for that to work. You can have method implementations on interfaces, which wasn't possible before C Sharp 8. But with that feature being added, that also had to have an update by the runtime and the, the framework components. So that's why you'll see that if you want to use C Sharp 12, you'll have to use .NET 8. But most of what's happening with the compiler is synthetic sugar and compiler magic. So I'm going to say this. While it's unsupported, you can still use C Sharp 12 with .NET Framework 2.0 for the features that just compile down to the, the supported IL. Now, I mentioned that one of the biggest things that have improved upon is performance. And 
while I'm not going to say that those of you that are on .NET Framework are Rusty developers, this is a very good illustration of what the work has been into making this better. They made some really good things that worked for a very long time, but it was time to improve upon that in C Sharp or in .NET 6 going forward. So a lot of work went into making this look very shiny, make it much more performant than what it used to be. This was all done by allowing them to use some language features and portions of .NET. They used spans and ranges, which is a concept that allows you to very efficiently work with memory. Now, spans and ranges have been around in C Sharp since, I believe, C Sharp 7.0, 7.123. They made some point releases with C Sharp 7 that introduced a couple of more features. So it's been around for quite some time, but it's just up until recently that they've heavily used this and refactor portions of .NET and ASP.NET Core and .NET MAUI and, and going forward with the other uh, portions as well. That's where they use this. And these together introduces a, a much more performant solution. So what is this? If you want to just get up to speed what this is. A range is a way for us to provide a syntax for accessing one or multiple elements, defining a range of elements. Python developers have probably seen this before. I could say, skip the first two elements and give me the rest of that sequence. I could say, give me everything up until one off the end of an array or a sequence of elements. I could say, give me two from the end and the rest of the list. Now, this alone isn't performance enough. It has to be coupled with something called a span. A span is a way for you to point to the start and the end of an array. And why is that important? Well, if you're a C++ developer, you know that pointers are very efficient. It's a very efficient way to use one collection, for example, and then slice off portions of that without allocating more memory or doing very heavy computations. So an example of a zero allocation code piece could be this here. I have this payload just a couple of bytes, could be text, could be whatever. This payload is now a byte array. I then simply cast it by doing an implicit cast to say that I'm going to look at this as a span of bytes. Of course, this here is going to allocate one reference on my, on my stack, but that's a very <laughs> effective allocation. So it's almost zero allocations. And then at the end here, what I'm saying, I want a subset of this, this array. I can say, give me the two last bytes in this array, and this will then create a pointer to those two last elements. Now, this looks very complex. I have another example where I, I get a read-only span of bytes, which is a UTF-8 string. Now, C Sharp and .NET have traditionally only been working with UTF-16. Everything in C Sharp and .NET has always been UTF-16 because they need a wider character set to support all the different languages and every culture out there. But if you're working with web development, most of the content on the web is UTF-8. UTF Doing the conversion between UTF-8 and UTF-16 is a little bit time consuming. So now we have support for UTF-8 string literals. So I have a constant here with my name. I simply say, I want to look at this as a span of bytes. I can find the space in the middle. I can slice off the first name and the last name. And this here is, in fact, not performing any additional allocations in terms of what's on the heap, in terms of copying an array over. This here is, someone is going to tell me, yes, you're allocating a couple of references on your stack. Sure, but accept that. There's zero allocations. So this here is truly, truly handy. I use this quite a lot to slice off. If I have a uh, payload coming in from reading hardware, I, I use this all the time. And then you can pass around the references internally in your applications without having to do any further copying of that memory. And they're doing this internally in ASP.NET Core, in .NET, in .NET MAUI, in Blazor, and all of those different components. And that is what's really building this super performant um, APIs. They also heavily invest in something called native AOT. Native AOT is a, is a process of natively compile your application ahead of time, so ahead of time compilation. I could take a C Sharp and .NET application, compile it for a very particular platform, like my Mac here, and say, I want this to run natively on my Mac. It doesn't have to rely on .NET being installed at all. So what the compiler will then do, it will take the parts of .NET 
and the .NET runtime that you use. It will natively compile that into the platform you're targeting, and you can then pass that on to someone that doesn't even have .NET installed. And that is extremely performant. Now, for things like ASP.NET, JSON serialization, and other types of processes like that, this has always been a little bit tricky. But with the addition of something known as source generators, they've been able to make this even better. So if you're using JSON in your applications, you can decorate a class to say that I want you to produce some source for this to make it possible to generate something during compile time that will build this for a native platform. And again, for very specific purposes. This is really important when it comes to mobile development or running things or running applications that need to start up really quickly. So going forward, you'll see this um, quite often, especially if you're doing .NET MAUI or previously Xamarin. They've also, again, I'm going to talk a lot about performance and how that's been improved in .NET, because it's one of the pillars. There's four pillars of .NET. There's performance, ASP.NET Core, Blazor, and cross-platform UI. With that being said, uh, performance is always going to be a really uh, heavy investment for Microsoft. And with this, they also introduce a performance-focused type called uh, Frozen, or Frozen Dictionaries. I was planning to sing a song from a Disney, from a Disney movie when uh, introducing this here, but the uh, video would probably be copyright striked. So that's probably not a good idea. But they've introduced system.collections.frozen, which allows you to point to a source dictionary, so it's then converted into a frozen dictionary. And why would that be important? Because when you freeze the dictionary, or a set, or another type of collection, this works with more types than just dictionaries, They've introduced an implementation that's very optimized for reading and accessing elements. So once, you, once you've produced your dictionary, if you know that you're only going to access elements, it's better to convert it into something that you cannot change after, afterwards. That means it's going to be very, very, very much faster. So that's the performance parts of this. Now, I'd like to spend some time talking about serialization. Serialization is something they've improved upon going all the way from .NET Core. Is anyone still using JSON.NET system or system JSON.NET? Yeah, Newtonsoft.json? A couple? Maybe 10 of you are using that. How many is using the new system.text.json? The rest. That's awesome. So it's interesting, because the difference between JSON.NET and system.text.json, guess what it is? It's the focus on performance. The important thing with system.text.json is that it's much faster than json.net. And the reason is because it's not as feature heavy as json.net. If you have a json document paste posted into your application, json.net will be very forgiving in what you, you, you post into that endpoint. Like it will very much deserialize anything. It will figure out the most things for you. That also means that it's going to take a little bit more time to deserialize your types or your documents. So with system.text.json, the idea is that if you own both ends of the, the text or the, the endpoints, why not use the fastest, appro fastest approach possible on both ends if you own both of those things? Or if you just tell whoever's posting data into your endpoint or your application that you should follow the, the JSON standard, then it will be, all be very good. So I'll mention a few things that have been improved upon in, in system.text.json. Now I'll show you this in, in Visual Studio. Or a couple of things. In, in .NET 8, they're going to introduce extensions for system.net.http. So we'll look at that first. There's, I have an HTTP client here that I've declared. It's simply using, using declaration, creating this new client. Now, the best approach would be to set this up using dependency injection, but it's for the purpose of this demonstration. I'm going to create a new instance. And then on the client, they've introduced an extension method called get JSON as async enumerable. This is interesting because now I can use a, what they call a streaming API to say that I want to stream data. But what happens here is that what, what it actually does is that it queries my API. It, it, it gets whatever this thing returns. It then deserializes that into an I enumerable that I can, can consume as a stream of elements. So I know that this returns an an array of stocks, in this case here, stock identifiers, just sample data. I can then say, for each element that I'm going to asynchronously retrieve, I can process that in my um, reach. 
So this here is the new streaming API, or the extensions for the streaming APIs. It's not going to introduce any paging. So if this here was paged, so let's say that you get 100 elements each time you call it, it's not going to do any magic like that. What it is going to do, though, if this endpoint returns a lot of data, it's going to have internal buffers to asynchronously read that. So it, re it will read one buffer at a time. It will deserialize that using the system.text.json and using the, uh, the stream for that as well, which means that you could potentially read a portion of that document and then stop when you found what you're looking for. So this, again, it's something that's going to be highly performant. And we could, of course, have queried this API on our own using um, just using the normal get async and then deserialize the entire document if we so sort of like to. It's quite just a handy feature. And then what they've introduced is, is JSON polymorphic or polymorphic serialization. This was worked upon in .NET 7 and was actually the first release of how this worked was in, in .NET 6. In .NET 6, you were able to say, I have an inherited type. I want you to serialize that into a JSON document. And you would get a very nice representation of that, that inheritance. But there was no way to deserialize that back into your application. The built-in system.text.json didn't have support for it. So with .NET 7, they introduced support for polymorphic deserialization. Super difficult word to say. So what you do is that you can say, I have a record here, which simply uh, is the base record. I have an inherited type that inherits from this user. And I can then, on the base type, say that this here has a type discriminator. It's going to be a JSON-derived type, so whenever you, you find the properties of those derived types, we can support this. There are some security concerns with allowing anything to be deserialized into anything. Imagine that I was also having like a super user or an admin here. Like if you're passing an admin into your application, then you could say that, oh, I just deserialized this data into something that it shouldn't be. So you have to be careful when doing this as well. But this here was added in, in .NET 7. And in .NET 8, they, they extended this, so they also now support properties that are coming from inherited interfaces which makes it even more complex. I honestly couldn't come up with a good example of that, so I just skipped it, and we were talking about normal uh, polymorphism instead. What they've also talked about adding is the support for populating read-only fields. So on this record, or on this user, I have a list of phone numbers. If you were to run this code or have this in, in .NET 7, it wouldn't do anything. It would skip anything that's read-only. But with .NET 8, it will create the instance of these phone numbers because we have the target type new expression here. And if it finds phone numbers inside my JSON document, it will add it to this list, which is amazing. Except when I built this demonstration, I found a bug in .NET 8, which is going to be fixed in .NET 9. So I know what's coming in the next version. Woo! All right. So what the bug is is that if you have a primary constructor, then it doesn't work. It just skips everything that's read-only. So um, they're going to have the support for this, but it's also going to be decorated as it's only going to work if you don't have a constructor or a primary constructor on your types. So if you're like me, spending a full day's work trying to figure out why this isn't working, just remove the primary constructor and that uh, JSON creation handling works. And it would populate this with phone numbers if it was uh, available in that document. So what's interesting here, not only that I found the bug, but the, the way that you can communicate with the .NET team now using GitHub, it's all open source. So I tried to look up what happens internally, and we had a discussion, and I had a discussion with the team, and like, how do I get around this? There's a bug in the, in the documentation saying that this works, but it doesn't work, um, which we then found out it's actually a bug in the deserializer. And you know, it's four, three, three-ish weeks until they're going to release .NET. Would it be a good idea to refactor the whole system.txt.json? Well, I said yes, but someone didn't agree with me. So we're going to wait. So again, um, deserializing into inherited type is probably the biggest thing for JSON, system.txt.json, and the streaming APIs. The support for that is really important. Now, in addition to that, they're also going to introduce something called time abstractions. I have a little bit of a code sample here. You're all writing tests, so how would you test this? 
Um, the problem here isn't that I have a class called order service. It's not that I have an, a method that takes an order. I don't really, using this method here, I wouldn't know that it, it calls datetime offset.utc now. Now, if you've seen my course on Pluralsight talking about how to efficiently work with dates and times and how to do that properly, you know that you should always use datetime offset. So that's not really the problem here. The issue is that what happens if I'd like to test this against, for example, when the time jumps over to winter time? Let's say we're building a ticketing system. I want to write a test that ensures that I can buy a ticket just a minute before it, it turns over to summertime, and then what happens with the validity the minute after when it's swapped over? Is the ticket still valid? Producing a test like that with this method would be impossible. And I know that there are probably some of you in here that already have like 10 different solutions to this. I have the same code snippet here in Visual Studio. I mean, I could take this UTC now, and I, I guess I could inject it into to the method, but I don't like that. I would have to then change the usage of this entire class or this method all over the place. And it's not necessarily a good idea either to change the constructor to say that, well, I could say that I'm going to introduce a constructor that takes a date time offset. But that would mean that all of my instances of the order service would have now. I know someone's much smarter than me in here now is now going to say, well, just wrap it in an action. Sure, we can do this. But still, I don't really particularly like this because it's not very, uh, it's not very extensible. Instead, Microsoft introduced, finally introduced, something called a time provider. A time provider is an abstract class that implements working with dates and times. We could, of course, also have used Noda time, which I know probably a few of you in here are using. It's a great addition. It makes it much easier to work with time zone differences and, and, and transitioning between times. But having something built into .NET is, is probably a good idea. So the time provider, I'm going to store this as a private field in my class. And now instead, sure, I can now inject this using, using dependency injection. And what this allows me to do is that I can do get UTC now, which is basically the same thing as the action that I introduced, except this has a lot of built-in functionality into it. The time provider, if we check the implementation, or the, the definition of the class. That's a reference to the system time. They have a default implementation of what the system's time would be. There's also a lot of, of virtual properties that we could use. So I could override how to get UTC now. Now, I could do this myself, or I could go ahead and use something called a fake time provider. The fake time provider, in this case here, allows me to say that I want to automatically advance the time each time you call get UTC now. So an example again, if I take my ticketing example, I could say that I'm going to purchase a ticket. It's going to get the UTC now out of my fake time provider. And then when I call get UTC now again, it's going to automatically advance with 24 hours. I could have done this with the action myself, but this here provides a much better experience. It would be now easier for me to, to use this provider and paste that into, into, that, uh, into that constructor. So this is a great addition, like making it a little bit more testable. Using dependency injection and inversion of control and, and just applying that principle is, is quite great. So I really enjoy this and like this approach, which also means that I could override this myself. I have a custom implementation here at the bottom. You probably shouldn't do this. But I can also inherit from this class to say that I have my time provider. It's called a custom time provider. And every time you call get UTC now, I'm going to return UTC now. But I could do whatever. I could return a particular date from this, this class. It's a good addition to .NET, in my opinion. Now, there's also been some improvements to how to work with random numbers, some cryptographic improvements. You probably shouldn't implement all the cryptographic stuff yourself unless you're a security expert. I'm not, so I'm not even going to show any samples of how to implement new SHA stuff. But this is a good addition as well if you're working with randomness. Instead of having to set up a new random yourself and providing a proper seed, you can now use the shared instance. And this here actually allows you to do more things than just getting that, um, let me show you, random.shared. This shared instance allows you to get like the next number that would be available. 
uh, you could say that you want to have a max value, like any, any instance of random, right? But in this case, they've set, out, set it up properly. It's more random than when you're setting up your random yourself. You could also say, which is pretty cool, you could say that you want to shuffle a span of values. You could say that you want to get an array of elements out of, of a, an existing array, saying, hey, I want three random numbers or three random elements in this array and it just works out of the box. So it gives you a, a thread-safe implementation or a thread-safe version of random that has um, some good seeding to it. All right, so that's the core API changes. There are a lot more added to .NET and C Sharp, and we're going to try and, and spend some time looking at that. ASP.NET Core has, again, also been improved in, in terms of performance. All of these changes in the core APIs and all the usages of the ranges and spans, all of that also transitions over to ASP.NET Core. But they've also introduced support for HTTP3. There's a lot of Blazor improvements. There's metrics, better debugging. There's a new identity endpoint. You can very easily set up identity um, now in ASP.NET. Instead of getting all that UI that you would get from the normal ASP.NET Core identity, you can now say, I want an endpoint that supports JSON, and that would just work out of the box. So how about we jump over to Visual Studio again and look at some of these changes. So I've, I've got an ASP.NET Core application set up here, and I've got a few things I want to show you. Now, one of the first things, they've added support for anti-forgery tokens in minimal APIs. This is the new process of building an ASP.NET Core application. Everything is set up in the, in the program.cs file. And this minimal API allows me to set up endpoints and their implementations. I could even use it to build a fully-fledged MVC application if I want to. But this is the first edition. Adding anti-forgery tokens and how to validate that has been added in, in minimal APIs. They've also added a concept called keyed services. Now, keyed services, imagine that I have an iCache. I'll show you this interface first. Imagine that I have an iCache like this here. And some, in some places in my application, I simply want to say, I will work with a cache. And, in, and I really only have a distributed cache or an in-memory cache. Maybe I want to allow anyone to inject whichever implementation they'd like to, but when I build the method, I'd like to have a preference. Maybe I want to say that I prefer the distributed cache if I'm running this through ASP.NET. But if you're building a test, you can pass whatever implementation you want. Traditionally, you'd have to then implement another interface because you can't have the same interface uh, added twice to the dependency injector. Now with keyed services, I can say that I'm going to add a transient that is going to be the default. If you simply request an iCache, you'll always get the in-memory cache. But if you've said that you want to have a distributed cache, I'm going to try and give you this. If it's not available, you'll get the default one. So the method that expects an, an implementation to be passed into it can be a little bit more specific about what it, um, what it expects. So this can be very easily used. I'm going to scroll down here. And what I'm saying here is that I have a map get, which simply maps the root of the application to, to this uh, anonymous method. It gets the HTTP context passed to it. I'm going to get a service, the iCache. The iCache is now going to be injected into this here. And I'd like to get the keyed service. So it's going to try and find the memory keyed service. But anyone that's using this method could, could pass in an iCache or anything that, that implements that interface. And being able to use attributes like this in Lambdas was introduced in C Sharp 11. I believe it was C Sharp 11. Um, so now you can really write powerful minimal APIs. There's no constraint in how to define your endpoints. So that's the key services. I think it's a good addition to the dependency injection. The next thing they've added is the support for exception handlers. You've always been able to inject an exception handler in the middleware pipeline. In ASP.NET Core, everything runs through a process of, of middlewares, but uh, adding multiple exception handlers before uh, was a little bit more tedious than it is today. So now you can say that I want to add an exception handler. It will be registered to the middleware processing or all the middleware um, execution. And this here is simply an I exception handler that will try and execute or try to handle that exception. The implementation isn't really important, other than I can access the HTTP context, like I'm doing here, to output some data to that, um, to that response. 
So previously, this was a little bit there was a little bit more code to do the same thing, but you've pretty much always been able to add exception handlers to ASP.NET. So there's, uh, you might see this as well require rate limiting. This is added in .NET 7. So .NET 7 introduced output caching as well as rate limiting, which is built into um, to .NET as well now. So I could set up a rate limiter that would uh, would be able to be configured to say I have a fixed window limiter. So I can say that within 10 seconds, you're only allowed to do one call, and you can have one more call uh, in the queue. One in the queue is probably not enough. This is from the same type with the same, end, or same, same requester, so the same machine requesting the same endpoint multiple times. It's great to have this built into ASP.NET Core, but remember that this is for this particular instance, if you have a scaled approach, like or a scaled application, this will be per instance. All right, so um, let's take a look at another cool thing that they've introduced, the concept of short-circuiting endpoints. So I could say that I'm going to map slash short-circuit to, um, to run this anonymous method. So whenever you call this, I'm going to run this code snippet here. And when you do dot short circuit, what it's going to do, it's going to register this a little bit differently than you do with map git. As soon as ASP.NET Core has performed its URL matching to figure out if you want to execute this endpoint, it will skip all the other middlewares. If you have short circuit, it's going to execute immediately. So that means it's going to skip authorization, it's going to skip cores, it's going to skip whatever middlewares you have defined in your pipeline. So why would you want to do this? For example, robots.txt. You don't really care about cores or rate limiting or whatever other middlewares you might have registered. Good addition to ASP.NET Core to be able to short circuit. You can also say app, um, let's see here, map short circuit, and that would essentially do the same thing. All right. The final thing that they've added in ASP.NET Core that I'm going to show you is the complex binding in minimal APIs. So you've always been able to do very complex binding when it comes to fully fledged ASP.NET Core applications, MVC, for example, or Web API. But now I could say that I have an iForm file being passed into my endpoint. This here is, is mapping a, a post request to this endpoint. So whenever you do a post into this endpoint, it's going to execute this. I'm going to expect you to pass a file into it. But I'm also going to expect an iAntiForgery token or an iAntiForgery. Traditionally, you've seen the validate anti-forgery token attribute on actions. It doesn't really work like that in, in minimal APIs. So you have to expect this interface to be passed into it. And when you do, you have to ensure that you validate the anti-forgery for that request. If you forget this, well, you're, you have a, a security issue. So probably don't do that. Now, if I put a breakpoint here, and I can run the application, I have a map get. I'm going to show you that first, actually, before we go into whatever browser I have default that's running. Um, oh, look at that. It's Edge. That's fine. So before we go to the upload page, I want to show you another cool thing here. So the same thing here. Uh, when I do a get request to slash upload, when I call slash upload, it's going to generate some HTML or output some HTML. This also has to do that anti forgery token. So actually, let's do view page source. There's a request verification token here. So how do I generate this? Like I mentioned that I, I don't really have the same capabilities in a minimal API. So the way you do this is that you have to also ask for the anti forgery implementation to be passed into the minimal API. You have to get a token that you then have to add to your HTML. I'm going to return a content result of type text HTML. And here is a way for us to do um, a raw uh, string literal. This was added in C Sharp 11. I'm not saying that you should write your HTML in line like this here. But for a very small sample, it shows you that you can, you can very easily uh, write content like this here. I do this for JSON, for example. You even get syntax highlighting if you, if you do this with a JSON document and do it in, in C Sharp. I can even use string interpolation with this uh, raw string literal. That means I can access the, uh, the name, which would be that underscore request forgery request verification token. And then I also add that as a value. And I simply say that this is a multi-part form. And I could then 
paste data into this here. Let's do choose file, hello NDC, open, submit. And I'm then passed into this, this um, minimal API endpoint. Now, I can, I can access this file here that I have, which is, we can see the, uh, the, the name of the text file, the content type. I could even request all the, the data out of this here. So this is the part of the complex binding that was introduced in ASP.NET Core 8. What they've also done a lot of work with is improving the debugger experience. If I hover the HTTP context, we can see here that we can get a little bit of a, a, information about what this is doing. Previously, this wouldn't show you any valid information at all. Let me just zoom in here if I can do that. I'm going to hover context. It's a post request to this endpoint using HTTP2. If we're streaming data, maybe we would use the new HTTP3 features in, in ASP.NET Core. I can now, let's see if I can do this with the zoom in here. I, I get a lot more details on all of these different properties. I don't have to drill down into each of them. So this is the improvement to the debugger experience. Compare this to what it used to be in older versions of uh, Visual Studio and in, in, in um, it's actually not a part of Visual Studio. It's a part of, of the changes in, in ASP.NET Core. They've simply overridden two string on each of these different types, which is a good addition, right? So that's it for the changes in ASP.NET Core. So we talked about the complex binding, the, uh, the rate limiting, and output caching. They, they also introduce metrics. But one of the, the most important things is probably being able to short circuit. We've probably been able to do this with other frameworks in the past, but short circuiting um, endpoints and, and what comes in from that is, is powerful. And the keyed services. Here, I can simply say that I register these two services as keyed services with a dependency injector, and then say that I request that particular one. It doesn't have to be the memory uh, key service, but if that's available, that's, that's totally fine. And then we have the complex uh, bindings in minimal APIs as well. So it might seem like they're small things, but internally it's, it's quite big improvements to both .NET as well as ASP.NET Core, which make it a little bit more fully fledged. Like if you've run into these issues or have had applications, you'd have to then transition into something much more complex, but now it's a little bit more simple. So I did mention that I didn't want to spend too much time talking about Blazor, because that's a, like an hour on its own. And is anyone here using Blazor? Yeah, a couple of hands, you know, a handful. So it's a really great technology, and with .NET 8, it's now what's the full stack web, it's the suggested full stack web UI going forward. So if you want a technology that is built for both the server as well as what's in the browser, you're going to use Blazor. You can even use Blazor to build mobile applications with .NET MAUI hybrid applications, or use this to build power web applications that you could also install on your devices. So going forward, we're going to see a lot more of, of improvements to Blazor, and it's now easier to build something that's full stack. So if, you've had, if you haven't looked at Blazor yet, I think with .NET 8, it's going to be a good, good thing to uh, at least take a look at. Now, we're going to spend some time talking about .NET MAUI. Not too much, but I do, I do think it's important because the work they've done to .NET MAUI is um, there's a lot of work that has gone into this product. .NET MAUI used to be Xamarin. Is anyone here using .NET MAUI? Who's still on Xamarin? A couple? Yeah. So there's a couple of you who are still on Xamarin. Now you're going to be facing the, the work of updating that to .NET MAUI. If you're already on .NET MAUI, that's great. You've already taken part of the improvements to .NET. .NET MAUI is also getting all of those additions to .NET in terms of performance fixes, the ahead of time compilation. So if you're building applications for iOS, Android, Windows, you're going to love all of these changes as well. Now, a little bit of history with .NET MAUI. They kind of missed the release of .NET 6 because it wasn't really completed. The, the experience developing with .NET MAUI and the refactoring for, please don't share this image. <laughs> Microsoft is going to kill me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so what they did was they, they, they wanted to improve Xamarin. There was a couple of things with Xamarin that didn't work as expected. So they wanted to do a lot of good work with .NET MAUI and make it much better, what everyone expected. But they didn't fully get there. Like They had the foundation built with .NET 6, but they just didn't get past that delivery deadline. So it was first released with .NET 7 with that um, standard support term release, which means that they 
it wasn't really meant for for well it, they, they did a, a global availability so it still worked but they still had a few things that were not really finished so with darknet 8 the idea is that it's now perfect it's now going to be the thing that you want to use for building mobile applications and i've had a look at all the quality improvements and the important things that have gone into it so a more fair comparison would probably be something like this here. On the left-hand side, we have a painting in .NET 7 that kind of set the outline for this entire way of building something. And they've, all, they've just colored in all the pieces with .NET 8. It's now a little bit more of a complete picture. It now allows us to more effectively build these applications. It still builds on top of the same foundation that, that Xamarin did. There's a lot of improvements internally, a lot of quality improvements, but it's still the idea is that you build something in .NET and it's going to work on iOS, Android, Mac OS, and Windows. So you still have your, your shared app code. You have .NET Mao in the middle that translates into specifics for .NET uh, for Android, .NET for iOS, .NET for Mac, WinUI, and so forth. And if you've never seen a .NET Maui project, it's a little bit different than what it used to be. There's a single project file. We're not going to spend much time in here, but it's a single project file. You have the different platforms. You could write code for the particular platforms if you want to, but you want to have the most code shared between the different projects. You could even use a file-based convention to say that my class .android.cs, and that file would then only be compiled for Android. So it's a little bit better of an experience compared to uh, um, what you might have been used to if you did mobile development before. With that being said, we're going to spend the, the rest of this talk talking about the features of C-sharp. There's been a lot added to C-sharp over the past decade. I've had developers come up to me that have done C-sharp since the, the, the first version of C-sharp. And they're telling me, like, I've been able to do most of this in my way forever. All of these new features are just very confusing. But to new developers that are maybe coming from Python, Swift, Java, PHP, or other programming languages, they're very used to this much shorter syntax and not being as verbose. And that's an important part of the compiler, introducing language features that architecturally change how we build our applications, how to better express ourselves to build the same things, like with async and await, but without having to worry about the in too much about the internals or writing too much code. And C Sharp 12 is not going to be any different. With C Sharp 12, we're going to get a handful of features. Some of them are more important than others, like with ed any release of, of the compilers. I am going to say, though, that because we are still a couple of weeks away from release, there might be more features added. There might be some of them might not come at all. We never know until they actually do um, .NET Conf. But the idea, though, is with, with C Sharp 12, we're going to get something called primary constructors. In this, in this um, case, it's going to be primary constructors with classes. You've seen the primary constructors with record types, but they're going to work a little bit differently. There's something called a collection expression and a spread operator. There's something called interceptors, optional parameters in lambdas, and then alias any type, as well as inlining arrays for a little bit more complex code. So let's jump into Visual Studio again. And I've got a couple of these uh, samples set up. So first, let's take a look at the collection expressions. I have this, this list of bytes here. This is the traditional way of declaring this. But we can see here that Visual Studio is already hinting that I can probably write this a little bit better. I could it, it suggest two things. I could use the target type new expression, which was added in C Sharp 9. Or I can use the new collection literals or collection initializers, which is a very handy way of saying, I don't want so much code. This here will then, we know that this is a list of bytes, but I could change this to a byte array. If I can figure out how to type on this Mac keyboard. And it will just figure out which type to create. So not only does it allow you to more efficiently define what you want to create, but it also figures out what type you're actually expecting. So. Once I've got this list of bytes created, which is a temporary list here, or it's a, an in-memory list, um, then I have the payload. I have the same thing for a checksum. And I want to combine these two into one new thing. What you've done in the past, I bet most of you have used link to do this. You want to have two lists and combine them to one. 
super simple to do that with Link, but it's a little bit more code, and it's, you never really know what's happening under the hoods and all the performance implications that could have. How about we, we, ask the, um, we ask the language to solve this for us? So I could now say, I'm going to create a new collection. I'm going to take all the elements from this first collection, and then I'm going to add the other section at the end. So this here, the dot dot, that's the same idea that we have in the ranges, but this here is known as the spread operator. So we're just spreading out the elements one after each other. So this here will then create a new list with these, um, with these values. They will all be uh, sequentially after each other. So it's not doing a, a two-dimensional array, but they're all just stored after each other. So that's the collection expressions and the spread operator. And I know a lot of us are probably sitting up arrays in memory like this here, doing stack allocations and so forth, but this here is just a very much nicer way of doing it. Now, the next one, we'll get back to interceptors. I have primary constructors at the bottom because in, in minimal APIs and in the new top-level statements, you can't declare classes anywhere but at the bottom of the files. And for some reason, I wanted to have it all in one file. Anyways, so with a class, let's say a user here, if I have a user and I have a primary constructor, this is a class, right? And I have added a primary constructor, which you've seen with a record type. The difference here is what's generated behind the hoods. When I do a record, it's going to generate the backing fields. It's going to generate publicly exposed properties. It's going to do value-based equality. It's going to generate um, overrides for toString to make it easier to print this out. If I change it to a class, all that's being generated is one backing field. So that's a big difference. So for a class or a data type or a record, like a user, it would make sense to keep this as a record because I would still expose this. I would expect that the username is somehow exposed uh, externally. Now, let's just change this back. I can access this private field inside, anywhere inside my class. For a user, this doesn't make any sense. Like for a data class, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it for a class. Where it does make sense is for something like a controller. I could say that this controller expects an interface of an iUser repository. I can then use that inside my methods, and it would be probably be a little bit more or less confusing if I didn't use a, a um, let's see here, let's do return. And I can then use the repository to calculate this here. And that would then be stored in a private field inside my class. I wouldn't expose that anywhere externally, right? How many of you would expect the repository to be publicly exposed as a public property so anyone can use it? No one, exactly. It's kind of a leading question. So um, this here is a very good addition because now I could just add this to my, for example, my MVC applications. I could remove the default constructors that I always add when I expect something to be passed into that controller. I could then just add the primary constructor instead and save a little bit of characters. Now, of course, going back and refactoring means I have to write more code, but if I did this from the start, I would write less code, and it would be a little bit more uh, easy on the eyes. Now, the final thing we're going to look at in C-sharp 12 in Visual Studio is something called interceptors. So now, imagine that I have this, this class here called a logger. I'm going to go into the instance. This class has a method called log. It calls its own internal method, which is private which simply throws an exception. It's using the, um, um, yeah, we're, we're just calling throw exception. So if I'm going to run this, we're going to run this with the debugger attached. Actually, I'm going to put a breakpoint up here at the top. Let's run it. I'm going to step over to this line, and I'm going to try and step into the method. And nothing happened. So it didn't step into the method. And if you run it without the debugger attached, it's going to say, hello world. I promise I'm running the same application, and I'm running this piece of code here. So how come it didn't run this method? It's because I've introduced an extension method in my application. So there's a method called debug log, which does exactly this. So it's, it could do hello world like this here. But what's actually happening is that the method call internally, this call is being intercepted or actually replaced during compile time. And all that you have to do is to declare 
um, an extension method that matches the signature of the method you want to intercept, and you add the intercepts location attribute. You then have to point to that particular code file, which seems a little bit tedious. But if I put a breakpoint in here, you'll see that it actually intercepts this. Hmm, for some reason, I could still not step into this method. How come? Because I also added debugger hidden. <laughs> So this is a funny prank to pull on your coworkers. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. Or just do it. It would be very funny. So why is this important? And why would this be something that you'd use? You probably wouldn't want to point to the exact location on your machine. You have to have access to the file. This has to happen during compile time. But what it actually does is that it, it very much replaces the method call. So instead of it doing log internal, it will actually do, it will actually do uh, this dot debug log message. So it will actually replace that call with this line of code here. Just because I added this attribute, you have to point to the exact location. I'm actually going to remove that because it didn't like that I changed my code. So you have to point to the exact row and the exact column in that file. And you're probably thinking, like, well, how would I know that? Well, you wouldn't but a source generator would. So if you pull in a NuGet package that has a source generator, it could generate an interceptor that intercepts different calls in your applications. It could find an attribute on your classes, and then in, it, using that source generator, it could inspect your code or the, the syntax tree and then replace all of this for you. It's very powerful. You probably wouldn't write a lot of this yourself, but you have to be careful. Probably someone in here thinking, well, this is a security issue. Well. Of course, Microsoft thought of this. You have to explicitly declare which interceptor interfaces you allow. So you, so it, you don't pull in any random package from NuGet, and that just suddenly replaces code in your application. Now, so why would this be important? Let me show you an example of this just in just a second. We're running out of time here. But I do want to just reiterate that we, we looked at the collection expressions, which introduces the spread operator and this new little bit nicer syntax for, for producing collections. We also got the primary constructors. Another example of just looking at this here, I'm going to jump over to, to, to VS Code. I have a user that takes a string and a date to time offset. If I look at the decompiled code, we can see that it actually just has two backing fields, a, primary or a, a, a default constructor, and then an override of two strings. What they also then introduce is this optional parameters in lambdas. While I can do this for any lambda in my application, this is, again, built for minimal APIs. So I could say that a minimal API expects something to be, to be default. So I did this. You might have seen this in the uh, ASP.NET Core sample. If I jump over here again uh, in the program, and we have a method here that has an input of anonymous, which simply throws an exception if that uh, is is, is not anonymous. So the default value for input is always going to be anonymous. So if I run this and I do input is equal to Philip, this here is going to hopefully throw an exception. There we go, throw an exception. And this also then uh, invokes that exception handler that I added earlier to generate this JSON. So this is a very good addition to it as well, that you can use default values in, in, the, um, in the minimal APIs. So again, you, it would then use that default uh, value. You can also alias any type. For example, at the top of my class, I could say I want to, whenever I refer to a point, that's going to be a tuple or a tuple, depending on how you like to pronounce that, uh, of with two fields. And then I can echo that out to the console and access those properly. So finally, we looked at the interceptors, which is a very nice way to say that I want to intercept this location. I want to replace this portion of the code. And why would we want this? Again, source generators. Why would we want source generators to build performance-driven performance, performance um, code? Interceptors in ASP.NET Core. Here's a snippet from, from um, the documentations. They've used this with a request delegate generator to allow you to, to write some really powerful code, or it generates powerful code, when it uses uh, publish AOT. So it's primarily built for ahead-of-time compilation. It's primarily used for something that source generators will use internally. 
So with 20 seconds left, let's talk about all the features in C Sharp 13. I'm just kidding. There's, um, there's lots of things happening with C Sharp and .NET. Hopefully, this gave you an inspiration as to what's coming in .NET, and that the fact that they're working on performance is, um, is, is really important, and it's going to benefit all of us. So you can go and read off the language feature status page if you'd so like to. And if you like listening to me, I have 20 plus courses on Pluralsight that you, you can check out. Or just put them on repeat, like I don't, it's, it's fine. With that being said, we've talked about a lot of the features in .NET and C Sharp. If you have any questions after this, I'm available on email. You can always send me questions, ping me on Twitter, talk to me in the hallway. I know that we've covered kind of a lot of things. It's been a little bit of a roller coaster going through all the features of .NET and C Sharp and everything that's going to happen with, with C Sharp and going forward. It's a lot to take in. Just imagine reading through all the documentations to get a grasp of the important features. There's quite a lot. But I'm here to help. If you have any questions, I'm available. And on your way out, please put a green thing in the box. The reds, there's a bin over here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. If you didn't like this, send me an email and let me know why. All right, thank you so much for listening to me.